how you can get your power windows to work smoothly for years and years and not have any problems with them. Now power windows are pretty simple devices. You push a button, it sends power and ground to a motor, and it turns in one direction and pulls your window down. And then when you push the button the other way, it goes up. It sends power and ground to the motor, but in the opposite direction. DC motors can work either way. So if you put positive here and negative here, they'll spin one way. And if you do it the other way, it'll spin the opposite way. So you got the same motor, and it just turns one way to go up and the other way to go down. Now I'm old school myself, myself, God. <laughs> you turn it one way, it goes down, and the other way it goes up. <laughs> Pretty simple, nothing really ever goes wrong, but almost all cars have electric windows these days. Now if they don't go up and down, here's a trick. We're trying the left rear one. We're trying to make it go down, but as you can see, the window's not budging. It's just staying where it is. But here's a trick to get them down if they're stuck. Often to get it come down if it's stuck up is, you just open the door, push the button that lets it go down and slam it. When they're stuck, that'll often let them go down again. Sometimes they can stick and here's how you can prevent the sticking. You get some silicone spray. Now don't be confused. This says WD-40 water resistant silicone spray. It's not WD-40 spray. WD-40 just makes it. It's an actual silicone spray. You can use any brand. The window rolls up on these runners. You just spray it in there. You get a little overspray, just wipe it off. And do the same on the back where the runner is. Then you run it back up and wipe off any little residue on the outside and on the inside. That's a good thing to do on a cloudy day like today or do it in the shade in the garage. You don't want to spray silicone on hot metal. If it gets on your paint, you can just wipe it off, especially when it's cold and not sunny outside. It's going to hurt anything. You just wipe it right off. And of course, do all four windows if they're electric windows. This little tiny bit of lubrication. And since, as it says, it's water resistant, it'll stay on there for quite some time. And here's another trick. If you have automatic lowering windows, just push it and let go. When it gets to the bottom, it automatically shuts itself off. It's a good feature to use. And if you don't have automatic ones, when you push it, when it gets to the bottom, let go. Don't hold it on while it's at the bottom. Because if you hold that switch on, it's continuously sending power to the motor, and the motor's going to be pulling it down, straining itself, and that's how the motors get burned out. And of course, the same thing goes when you put it back up. Now, this is an odd car. It has automatic down windows, but not automatic up. When I let go, it stops. So, if you've got one of these, when you get up to the top, when it gets to the top, let go because the same physics is involved here. If you're pulling it up and it goes all the way up and you keep holding onto it, then it's pushing as hard as it can. And I've even seen some of them, if they hold them long enough, not only can it damage the motor, but it will bend the regulator assembly that pulls it up and down. Now, of course, the best systems are like in my wife's Lexus where the automatic goes down, then it automatically stops. And then when you make it go up, you let go, it automatically goes up and then stops. If you have this kind of system, just use the automatic stuff all the time. Then it will automatically shut up at the right time and it won't have any problems with over tensioning the assemblies. Now here's another power window tip that can really save you money. A lot of times as a car ages, especially if you're driving at night, if you hit the switch to make the motor go up or down, the window starts moving and you see that the engine either starts idling lower or if you're just at a stop sign, the headlights might start to get dimmer. Don't necessarily condemn the motor and think you have a bad motor. As nutty as it sounds, check under the hood first. Have the battery and alternator checked first. If your battery is weak or your alternator isn't charging correctly, and this test takes about two minutes, then when you turn the electric motor on to make the window go either up or down, they use a reasonable amount of power. If the battery's low or the alternator's weak, it'll often make the car idle a little weird, or the headlights dim at night, and it's really not the motor, it's the battery or alternator not charging right. I, in the past, I've had people come over here, and they said, oh, Scotty, when I was doing my windows, it got dull, so a guy sold me a window motor assembly for the driver's side, but it still does it. And then I find out that, hey, the alternator was weak, wasn't charging, and he'd wasted all his money on that window assembly. Now, if your battery checks out okay, and your alternator checks out okay, and it still does the dimming or idling pour when you turn it on, then odds are the motor is just starting to wear out, or the regulator. And from my experience with most cars these days, 
if you do have a problem, you can easily buy one of these aftermarket motor regulator assemblies. I've seen them where if you bought the motor and the regulator separately at a dealer, it could be almost $400. Where you can get a motor regulator assembly for under $100 at most discount auto parts stores, and they work perfectly fine. Now, the last trick about power windows has to do with the switch assembly. Under no circumstances let kids spill big gulps on the assembly, especially on the ones that have the assemblies in the middle of the car. That sticky, syrupy stuff will ruin these switches. You might think, oh, it's just a switch. Some of these switch assemblies can cost four or five hundred dollars on modern cars. Keep water away from them, especially sticky drinks, beer, whatever. You don't want to ruin these switches. They're not just a simple little switch, they're a little computer microcircuit board on most modern cars. Now when I was a young mechanic back in the 60s, Hey, there was all kinds of stuff you could do to keep your car running. Cars needed tune-ups, they needed carburetors adjusted, points set. But these days, hey, most things are computerized. That still doesn't mean that things don't need to be cleaned, though. Yeah, cars don't have carburetors that need cleaning, but they have throttle plates. Inside here is the throttle plate. They get dirty, they can clog up. So you can get some spray cleaner and clean them. And the same thing goes for mass airflow sensors. They can get dirt and crud and need cleaning every once in a while. You just unplug the sensor uh, and unscrew it and then wiggle it and pull it out. And as you can see in there, the sensor part here has a lot of dirt on it. And there's also dirt inside, so you just spray it clean. You just spray it till all the gunk gets off of it. And also spray the inside on one side then turn it over and spray the inside of the other side to back flush it. And now you can see how nice and shiny the chrome is here, all the dirt's off of it, and the inside's clean too. Then let it air dry about 15-20 minutes before you put it back on, so we'll clean the throttle while we're waiting for that. Now the air box is in the way to get to the throttle, so we got to take the air box out of the way. Then we loosen the clamps of the other part and pull it off. Then when that's all out of the way, there's the throttle that we want to clean. You can see it's all dirty inside. Then start spraying all the crud out. And you also want to push it with your fingers so you can get inside and clean. And also have a rag to wipe it all clean. Just look at all the crud that it's cleaned off. And just like the math cleaner, when you use the throttle cleaner, let it air dry for 15 minutes or so, so it gets all the vapors out. Now you don't need to do this all that often. Maybe once every 30, 40,000 miles or something. It's not that big of a deal, but if you don't do it, you get carbon build up, it can run wrong, the computer gets wrong data because either the mass airflow sensor's dirty, or if the throttle's dirty, it'll be sticking open a little, and then the throttle position sensor will give inaccurate information to the computer, and it won't run right. And sometimes something as simple as spray cleaning it can fix that. And don't forget your air filter. I have seen more problems being created by clogged up air filters over the last 51 years. Because the computer and everything was set up for a certain octane of gas. Now, if you're going in the reverse direction, a modern car that's set up for high test gas, most of them will run perfectly fine on any gasoline you put in them. Like that Ford Mustang with the four cylinder EcoBoost engine that puts over 300 horsepower out. They even say, if you use high test gas, it puts out 300 something horsepower. But if you use the lower test gas, then it only puts out 200 something horsepower. It'll still run perfectly fine, but it won't have the power. But if you have a car, like this Toyota, that was made for regular octane gas, not only are you throwing your money away putting higher octane gas in it, it can actually run worse. So don't throw away your money at the pump. Do what your manual says for your car. Whatever octane rating it says, don't buy any higher, you're just throwing your money away. Now the next thing to check, especially in the summer, is make sure your cooling fans are working right. So turn the AC on full blast, put it on full speed, then check the cooling fans. This one's blowing, and that one's blowing. Over the years, I've had many customers have one or both of the fans stop working. Now the insidious thing is, if one doesn't work and the other does, the temperature gauge might stay pretty much near the normal on your dash, 
but you're not getting correct airflow. So you want to make sure that both fans are working correctly. Because if you don't have full airflow, that wears things out faster. On a highway, of course, it doesn't make any difference. You got 60 mile an hour wind when you're going 60, but in stop and go traffic, it's very important that all the fans are working correctly. So check them every once in a while if you got an older car. Now in the summer, you want to make sure that your cooling system is working right. In conjunction with the air conditioning system, it takes heat out of the cabin so you don't get hot under the collar when you're driving in hot summer weather. Now cooling systems are sealed systems, but take the condenser right here. That's in front of the radiator. It looks like a radiator, but it's the AC condenser. The AC condenser is here. It's in front of the radiator. And if those fins get any kind of bugs or goop on them, you want to make sure that they're clean. You can easily hydrate them the garden hose. It can hose off baked on dead bugs which can restrict the airflow to the condenser and since the radiator is behind that restricts the flow to the radiator and things just won't work right. Now it's always a good idea every once in a while to glance at your temperature gauge. You want it to run where it normally runs. Most cars run halfway or a little bit over halfway and there's a reason for that because car engines run on a double-edged sword here. You want them to dissipate the heat that the engine creates because if it doesn't the engine will blow up but two you don't want an engine running too cool. They don't work right then. Let's say your car normally runs halfway. If you find the temperature gauge is running like one-third of the way instead of half it's actually running too cool which can damage the engine bearings over time and you'll get worse gas mileage which may sound counterintuitive but it isn't. You don't want an engine that runs too cold. Colder is not better. Although on the other side, if an engine runs too hot, once the coolant starts to boil, then it's no longer dissipating the heat from the engine. So basically these things are set up so that the coolant doesn't boil, but they're running pretty hot. And the reason they don't boil is because they're pressurized systems. Now water boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. If you notice, you open the radiator cap on a hot engine, a lot of times it starts bubbling all over the place. That's because it's running at over 212 degrees Fahrenheit, but the pressure makes the boiling temperature go up even higher because it's pressurized. But once you release that pressure, then it starts to boil. And as I said, once it starts boiling, it's no longer dissipating the heat the engine creates and the engine will blow a head gasket or break your internal parts. So you got sitting on the fence situation with you don't want an engine to run too cool, but you don't want it to run too hot. Now realize with modern cars, the electrical system is very important. You want to have a good battery and you want to make sure it's connected tightly. So every once in a while with some battery protection spray, just go to the battery. It was one of these battery cleaner tools that cost practically nothing. Clean the terminal, any corrosion. And here you can see there's bare metal. Clean that too. Then get a can of the spray. Spray it on the terminals. It keeps the acid from eating them. And in this case, it's bare metal. Spray it. Then it'll keep battery acid from eating it up. Batteries give off a little acid, acid will eat up the metal, you get corrosion, then it might not start the car or it might not charge right because the corrosion increases the resistance, makes it get hot, can short out stuff. Can that spray? If you're not a mechanic like me and you only have your own cars, will last you a lifetime. Then of course comes changing your oil. If you do no other maintenance on your car, change your oil regularly. Go buy what the engine says, what the manufacturer tells you to use. In this case, 10W30 oil. And you can use any quality oil. Here in the United States, I have the API service. That rates it. As long as it's the correct rating, it's perfectly fine. And regular oil, semi-synthetic oil, synthetic oil. And these old ones, you can pretty much pick what you want. But on the new ones, let's say it says you have to use a 0W10 oil. Well, you have to use synthetic because synthetic's the only ones that can be rated at a zero in the beginning. So you have to use synthetic oil on the modern cars. And I've got whole videos on this, but basically, an old car like this is 26 years old. I use normal Castrol, normal oil. I change it every 3,000 miles. With normal oil, 
you can change it every three to five thousand miles regular driving city driving compared with highway driving all a mix of driving and if you have a modern car that has to use synthetic oil I still say change it every five to seven thousand miles I don't believe in the ten thousand miles or that crazy mobile one 20,000 mile oil you're pushing it too much if you try to change it that infrequently engine costs a lot of money to replace thousands and thousands of dollars just change it frequently and if you don't drive much change it once a year things build up in the oil water acids and stuff and if you don't drive it much it's still going to go bad change it once a year then now the next thing is your coolant this is a Xerox for Toyotas for Asians and as it says here it's good for five years or 150,000 miles some are even good for seven years or 175,000 miles you don't have to change this stuff all that often when I was a young mechanic it was all green antifreeze it was good for maybe three years you had to change it a lot more often you don't have to on your modern car check with your particular car of course you don't have to buy over expensive dealer fluid the dealers don't make the fluid anywhere else somebody else makes it and then markets it for themselves Toyota doesn't make coolant either does Mercedes Benz they just buy it from another company so there's nothing wrong with using the Xerox in a Toyota it's made for Toyotas and other aged vehicles you can pay a lot less for this than you will at the dealer and it works perfectly fine just remember to do it when it's time maybe write it in a notebook put it on your phone put a date so you'll remember modern engines yeah they're made out of a lot of aluminum people say oh well Scotty aluminum doesn't rust so I don't care well aluminum corrodes really badly as it ages if the anti-corrosion inhibitors in the coolant break down so if you got to change it once every five years or 150,000 miles no big deal now the next thing is your automatic transmission fluid this is a dinosaur it's 26 years old it's a good idea to change the fluid it's an easy job this one's got a drain plug you can just drain it a few quarts come out measure what came out pour it back in easy job but don't be fooled by more modern cars that don't even have a dipstick where they say it's the lifetime fluid you still have to change that fluid that's a bunch of nonsense as I've said many times I've talked to the engineers where I said what do you mean by this lifetime fluid and they said well the fluid is good for the lifetime of the transmission then I said well what's the lifetime of the transmission they say well the warranty goes out at 60,000 miles then it's on you well truth be told with any vehicle <laughs> if you don't change it for the first 60,000 miles it's probably still gonna work perfectly fine but then when it gets older maybe has 100 150,000 miles if the transmission goes out and it costs you five six seven thousand dollars to replace it you're gonna be mad you didn't spend a little of money and change the fluid every once in a while and yes the modern transmissions all use full synthetic fluid which lasts longer but me I still change it every 60 to 80 thousand miles you can learn how to do it yourself a lot of the processes if you start from scratch are very complicated but almost all of them you can drain out fluid to the drain measure how much came out you take the top bolt off and you pump in the same amount that came out and that's perfectly fine because in any transmission sealed or not gears wear metal stuff comes out I have done late model cars that they say was a lifetime fluid and when I took the drain bolt out it was a magnetic drain bolt and they'd have little pieces of metal filings on them relatively normal if there's only a little bit but that stuff's in there you want to drain it out every once in a while now the next maintenance is brake fluid now brake fluid is hygroscopic so what it does is it absorbs water vapor and that eventually will corrode the systems out so it's a good idea to flush them out every once in a while but you want the real truth on that that depends a lot upon the vehicle you're driving Toyotas have pretty sealed systems there pretty well this thing's 26 years old you know how many times I've flush the brake fluid never and it still stops good it's got the original master cylinder the original wheel cylinders it's got the original calipers in the front they don't leak it stops perfectly fine because it's a Toyota but let's say you bought a Chrysler well then I made as well my advice would be ah, every four or five years you might want to flush the brake fluid out because they will get contaminated because they're not made as well they're not sealed as well and they will get problems from too much water getting in and then it corrodes the system and the master cylinder goes out ABS system might even have a problem on it because that's got a lot of valves and stuff in it that can corrode but let's say you're not a guy like me you know keep your cars for 10 20 30 years odds are 
If you buy a car, you'll never even have to mess with the brake fluid. Because I've seen them go seven, eight years with no problems at all. Never been flushed out and had no ancillary problems from corrosion in the system. If you're going to get rid of a car and not keep it for 10, 15, 20 years, a lot of times you don't do anything to the brake fluid. And the same advice goes for power steering fluid. If you don't drive your cars forever like me, odds are you can just leave that fluid alone. It does have a lot of pressure, sometimes over 1,500 pounds per square inch, but it takes a long time for it to get dirty. But if you keep them forever like me, every eight or nine years, you might flush out the power steering fluid, put new fluid in so it doesn't corrode anything. Because at that high pressure, any dirt becomes like a cutting fluid. And since it's 1,500 PSI, it can eat the seals on your power steering rack, on the pump, cause the rubber hoses to corrode inside, and then squirt out, flush it out every eight years or so if you keep your cars forever. Now the next maintenance item is your tires. Just check the air pressure every once in a while when it's ice cold. It gets hot, they expand, it's physics, the pressure will go up. Check them first thing in the morning. You don't want them over inflated or the middles will wear. And you don't want them under inflated or then the outsides will wear and your gas miles will go down because it'll have more friction on the ground and it'll wear everything else out and get worse gas mileage. And realize that tires have a limited lifespan. They dry rot from the ultraviolet rays of the sun. So check them every once in a while. All the tires on my cars, I end up throwing them away when they still got a ton of tread because they're dry rotted because we don't drive many miles. This thing last year, I think I drove it 500 miles. So if you don't drive much over a certain period of years, you just check the tires. If they're starting to have cracks and stuff, then you think it's time to get new tires. So now you know some basic maintenance items that you can do to make your cars last as long as possible. You can have a car like mine that's 26 years old, still runs like a top. So if you never want to miss another one of my new car repair videos, remember to ring that bell.